still believe Joe Montana is a better quarterback than Tom Brady. I believe John Elway was a better quarterback than Tom Brady. I believe Steve Young was a better quarterback than Tom Brady. And a number of others. I believe Brett Favre was a better quarterback than Tom Brady. Now, different styles, different eras, different rules, different teams. Hard to compare. That's why you don't do it that way. If you want to compare in any way, you stick with the era they're in. Not where they cross over a little bit. Because that's guys at beginning of career and end of career. And it doesn't match up. you got to take their peer group. Their group, you can compare within that. You can debate within that. That's how I see it. That's real talk. So I'm with Joe Montana on that. I can't say Tom Brady's now the greatest ever. Tom Brady is a good quarterback. No doubt about it. It doesn't matter how you feel about him as a person. That's not what we're talking about on this show. What we're talking about on this show is what happens on the field. What has to do with sports. And as far as that goes, if you're going to hate on him, you're hating on him because you're jealous. You're hating on him because he's not on your team. Because as a football player, as a quarterback in this era, and really in his place in history, he will go down as a very good player. F- flat out, simple, no debate in it. One of the greatest things I, I that came out of that for me, in fact, it probably is my favorite comment, favorite remark after the game was Bill Belichick saying they are now five weeks behind most of the NFL in the 2017 season. That's the mentality you want your coach, you want your organization to have. Yes, this was a great accomplishment. I got a smile on my face. My hair is wet. We're going to enjoy it. But when it comes right down to it, we're now five weeks behind. And that's why teams like the San Antonio Spurs, let's go with them, and the New England Patriots have been so successful. You look at those two organizations, 16 years, each have five championships. They have each done it over a long period. They each have stable coaching situations, stable organizations, veteran leadership. They're not afraid to make a hard move. They're not afraid to bring in a guy that maybe not be well known. It's a very good model. It's not going to work everywhere because it goes from the top down. The owner has to buy in. The GM has to be on board. The coach, the players, the trainers. It's something everybody has to buy in for that situation to work. And in the NBA and the NFL, those two teams have been able to do it now for a long period of time. Long period of time. Very successful. And, you know, I've talked about Pop. I think Popovich is the greatest coach. I really do. And I know I just went through, you can't say the greatest of all time because of eras. It's a little different in basketball. The rules haven't changed so much. Yes, you got a lot more ticky-tack stuff now, a lot more phantom calls now. The refs don't necessarily let the guys play as much anymore because the league's view on image has changed over the years. You can't have punching and fighting when you're trying to make millions of dollars off of people and have kids be interested in the sport. So you can't promote the violence, so you have to try and change the rules to get through. But the game of basketball as a whole really hasn't changed. Um, The way some of the principles Pop uses are still some of the original principles that started in basketball. He's not a favor, uh, a favorite, fan favorite of uh, the three-point shot, for instance. He's on record of saying he doesn't even like it. Um... Which is funny because the Spurs have taken advantage of the three-point shot in the past to win championships, but whatever. Pop's a great coach. Um, He's one of, I'll put it this way, he's not the greatest of all time, but he's probably my favorite. He is my favorite coach of all time in the NBA. And uh, Belichick, you know, at some point when he retires, they're probably going to go ahead and just make Coach of the Year award Belichick. You can't change the Super Bowl trophy from the Lombardi trophy to the Belichick. But you can make the Coach of the Year award probably his name when all is said and done there for him in New England. This is something I want to touch on. It's kind of political. It's kind of sports-oriented. But this White House nonsense, everybody wanting to get mad or get upset or call racial slurs or make names at these athletes who are deciding to pull out of going to see uh, the, the White House trip now that Trump is in office. Last time I checked, this was supposed to be the home of the free. Meaning you have a choice to do something that's not required. 
and to some is an honor, and to some it is not. So to the six patriots so far who have decided because of who you are as people or things that you have going on in your life that you're not going to make that White House trip, good for you. I have no problem with that. And nobody else should be calling you names or putting you down or saying anything bad about it either. Saying, oh, if they did this to Obama, people would have been blah, blah, blah. They did do it to Obama. Brady did not go see Obama. Okay, uh, Osweiler did not go with the Broncos last season to see Obama. Players pull out all the time. Michael Jordan has pulled out of a White House trip. Larry Bird has pulled out of a White House trip. Okay, Winter Olympian uh, Maddie, Maddie Bauman this week said she doesn't think she would go to the White House. It's not a race thing, people. To some people, yes, meeting a president is an honor. To some people, meeting a president who they don't believe in or doesn't have their best interest or they don't feel comfortable around, that's not an honor to them. That's a vacation they don't want to take. It's not a requirement. The only thing that I really think of that's cool about that is that those presidents end up with some awesome sports memorabilia collections. That's what's cool about it to me. And think about it. Go check all the team pictures with all the presidents. You're not going to find every player from every team at every White House trip. So everybody out there who just wants to be mad and hate about this, please move on. Let these men just do what they want to do. They won the Super Bowl. They get to decide if they want to take advantage of the perks that come with participating in that. Not you. If you want to share your opinion, fine, do that. But to be ugly and mean and rude about it, not cool. We don't need that in the sports world. Don't need it. Don't want to see it. Not what it's about. Okay? So let's move on from all that. It doesn't matter how many more guys go. It doesn't matter who doesn't go. I'm sure Trump would be fine standing up there with Kraft and Belichick and Brady and celebrating it that way since they're all friends. But that's them. Let them do them. Let other people do other people. It, if, it, if it's not affecting you, just let it be. Please. Now, moving on. Big topic this week. Almost, you know, drowned out everything that was going on with the Patriots in the Super Bowl. The New York Knickerbockers. Unbelievable. I don't even know where to start with this situation with Carmelo and Phil Jackson, with Robert Dolan and Charles Oakley. I mean, all the coaching changes, the bad free agent. This is a team I loved watching the Knicks play throughout the 90s. Okay? That was the height of me watching the NBA. That was the height of my excitement was throughout the 90s, the early 2000s. I'm still a fan now, but not as big of a fan because we don't have as many of those those deep rivalries. I think there's too many teams. I think the talent pool in the NBA has thinned out some. Or maybe just the desire and the drive has thinned out some. But there's something missing from when I love the game to where it is now and I just kind of enjoy the game. And for me, back in the 90s, watching those Knicks teams, they were always one of the best. That's made, it, it's what made basketball fun It come playoff time where the Knicks games, the Bulls games, you know, the, the good teams with the, the history and had things going on. That's what you wanted to see. And Charles Oakley was a part of that. I always, you knew he was rough. You knew he was mean. You knew he came from a, a, a rough beginning. You knew he was hardened. You knew he wasn't no punk. And it saddened me. It was embarrassing for me. It was embarrassing to see the Knicks have fallen so far since the year 2000. With so many bad GM choices. With a, a horrible owner who, who really you know, doesn't show he cares at all. As long as he's making money, who cares? So bad GMs, bad owners, coach after coach after coach with bad free agent signings, 
draft picks that haven't played out, trying to force people to play the triangle offense from your from your office, bringing in Jeff Hornacek to run an offense he's never had anything to do with, putting bad players on on the team that are at the end of their life that can't shoot three throws, free throws. It's it's just been hard to watch. And in that time, they've alienated uh, Patrick Ewing. They've alienated uh, MSG longtime announcer Marv Albert. They've now banned Charles Oakley because pretty much he speaks his mind. As a former Nick, as a former any team, you don't have to have everything you say be positive. If you don't agree with it, you don't have to say something positive. You can say, look, I think this is this. I think this is that. I don't agree with this. I don't agree with that. And Charles Oakley has had some harsh comments to say about what's going on with the Knicks organization. James Dolan didn't like that. He doesn't like the way Charles Oakley interacts with people. Well, you didn't come from where Charles Oakley came from. Okay? You need to try and understand people a little bit better and not just be turned off because, oh, he's loud or he's aggressive or he yells. Well, live his life. If everybody just took a moment to go, okay, let me try and think of it from where they're coming from or how their life might be and where maybe what affected them today. And then this incident the other day. He's coming down to sit in his seat. If you see the TV footage, it looks like, hey, he's there. He started up. He's this big angry man doing this aggressive and doing all this stuff. I saw the footage. And I instantly called a former boss of mine in event security. Mike Fruitman works for Argus. If you're interested, go check it out. I think they're hiring right now here in the Colorado area for the upcoming uh, soccer season. So if you're interested, you know, they do different events around the city, different venues, different concert venues, different sporting venues. So if you're interested, check that out. Anyway, a little free plug for them right there. Um... I contacted him. I said, Mike, I can remember from my time working with you, I can see a number of things they could have done differently to avoid that outcome. And, you know, he he, he was basically in agreement with me. Yes, there were things that could have been done differently. When you're approaching a situation like that, you always approach it as if you don't know the individual because 99.9% of the time you don't. But in this case, they did. They know who Charles Oakley is. They know how he is. So to surround him like that, to, to group in on that, make there no space, to have somebody come around the back of him. And from the TV footage, you don't necessarily see everything. But there's fan footage out there now. Okay, You can see Oak comes down. He's walking down. He doesn't even have his butt in the chair before guys are walking towards him to get him out of the stadium. Now, maybe that's because of the rumors that we hear James Dolan doesn't like him or James Dolan didn't want him in the arena and he had already been banned. And when Dolan found out, he said, get rid of him. Now, maybe at that point, as he's walking to his seat, yeah, he does say some stuff to some security officials. He does say some stuff on his way to the seat that he purchased. Then they start putting their hands on him. You see him say, get your hands off of me. And at first he swipes them. Then they put their hands back on him. That's when he gets a little more forceful with it. That's when he gets a little more agitated. He feels a little more uncomfortable. I understand that. I would not have approached it that way. It would have been pure talk. It would have been one or two guys up there trying to talk to him with everybody else on standby further down. And you want to go, oh, he's so big. You don't know what he's going to do. Uh, The Knicks want to say he's got a drinking problem. Then why didn't the police charge him with anything to do with alcohol after Dolan asked for him to be removed from the arena? This is a personal attack on a former Nick great. It's another embarrassment to me in the eye of the New York Knicks organization that has fallen so far in a short amount of time. You're going to charge a former player because you don't like things he said about the team. You're going to ban him now and say, hopefully he can take the steps and say the things that need to be done to to fix the situation. Well, Mr. Dolan, I hope nothing more than the, for your Knicks fans to all convert over to Brooklyn fans. Because then maybe your eyes will open up to what you were doing to a great historic organization. I hope Phil.